Hello and welcome to Sync Music Matters, a podcast that explores the beautiful relationship between music and the moving image. My name's Jim Hostrip and I'm your host on this journey, as each week I chew the fat with industry professionals who, on a daily basis, work with music for visuals. Now you might immediately assume that I'm talking about composers, but I'm also talking about editors, music supervisors, directors, and anyone else who's involved with the synchronous process of pairing audio and visuals. In this episode, I'm talking to Oscar-winning film composer Stephen Warbeck. Stephen generously shares his thoughts on having work rejected, getting fired before you've even started, dealing with, let's say, direct French directors, bringing a unique personality to your music, the Beatles versus the Rolling Stones, and what he plans to do should he reach 80 years of age, which I sincerely hope he does. It's also worth mentioning that all of the music discussed in this episode is linked to in the show notes, which you can find at my website, larpmusic.com forward slash sync music matters podcast and sync music matters podcast is hyphenated. So Stephen won the Oscar for best original score for Shakespeare in Love. He then went on to score such classics as Captain Corelli's Mandolin, Billy Elliot, Birthday Girl, Quills and Mrs. Brown, to name but a few. Stephen's most recent scores include DNA, which received a César Award nomination for Best Original Score, Uncle Vanya, starring Toby Jones and Richard Armitage, and The Children Act, starring Emma Thompson and Stanley Tucci. When he's not scoring films, Stephen also composes for theatre, and credits include Wolf of Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies for the RSC, and This House for the National Theatre, which is where I had the immense pleasure of meeting and working with Stephen. And if all of that wasn't enough, Stephen also has a band called Kippers. Stephen Warbeck, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Good. Thank you very much for uh, being there on the other end of the Zoom. <laughs> it's my pleasure. I, I seem to spend a lot of time on the other end of Zooms these days. Um, the question that I kind of like to ask everyone as a starting point is, if we, we, if we were to rewind a few years um, and, say, speak to a kind of eight or ten-year-old Stephen Warbeck and ask him, what would you like to be when you grow up? What, have you, what would you have replied Oh, at eight or ten, I think yeah. um, a designer of high altitude aeroplanes. Oh, really? Yeah, but I don't think it lasted long. I think it then turned into at about nine. If you said at eight, at about nine, I think I wanted to be a paleontologist. Oh, really? But there is a sort of obsession with fossils, which is quite common among children. I don't yeah. know what it is. And it sort of wears off as you turn into one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> How did the progression go from aeronautical engineering to paleontology to composition? Well, what happened was I'd been given uh, piano lessons from very, very young. Um, not forced, necessarily, uh, but they were quite off-putting when I was four because the um, walls were yellow and the ceiling was yellow and the keys of the piano were yellow because the piano teacher chain-smoked. And I kind of dreaded going in. I didn't really know why. Anyway, um, no, in, in my teenage years, I thought, hang on, maybe I should be a rock star, which I didn't become. <laughs> but but um, it suddenly started to appeal to me because I've been learning uh, classical piano and classical violin as a child and suddenly thought, hang on, there might be another aspect to music that's more just more kind of friendly at parties and things like that. So so I, I, I um, decided that that was probably the way to go. Uh, parallel to that, I was enjoying theatre. So there was a kind of dual thing happening through my teenage years. And, and um, when I went to university, it was to study drama and French. But every single um, university production needed music. So... That's where the music really got going fully. So you were kind of involved with drama projects, presumably as a as an actor, but ended up actually doing music. For exactly, the exactly. And what, and my first job out of university was, um, well, I was an actor and musical director for a small tour from Theatre Royal Stratford East, which was very entertaining, but. Um, yeah, so the the first few years, up to 1985, I was doing both. I was acting and um, composing and directing music. Oh, fascinating. But you 
the love love lay lay with them um, composing rather than acting. Well, I don't. I'm. I wonder if I ever make any decisions myself because it. What actually happened in 1985 is my then agent had a bit of a strop, and he said, "I just don't know what to do with you. I don't know how to sell you. I mean, what are you? Are you a musician? Are you a composer? Or are you an actor?" And I said, "Oh, uh, well, I'm a composer," and sort of slightly randomly chose that path. Although it would have to be said that I was starting to get a bit more satisfaction from sitting slightly outside a project and being a bit more objective and um, and writing the music for stuff. So it did kind of evolve into that. Wow. That's fascinating. And am I right in thinking that you've recently co-directed a film? Yeah, now what happened there was for about five or six years I was writing little scenes in a book um, the book's over there. I won't get it, though. Um, and um, then I was working with uh, Dominic Drumgoul. I worked with him as a theatre director a lot. Then suddenly he he left the Globe Theatre where he was director and he, he set up a film company and he said, I'm going to do some films. And I was in the bar after a play or something and said to him, well, I've got something you should read. You know the way you're supposed to suggest projects and I suggested it and about six months later he said I'd really like to do this um so I then decided that I needed to work with somebody who's more experienced in handling the technical side of filmmaking because obviously I've been exposed to films for for years because I've scored loads of them but um I thought I need somebody to work with um who knows who can work fast because it wasn't a very big budget so I worked with John Paul Davidson, who's been, since he's in his 20s, he's been mainly, not exclusively, but mainly a documentary film director. Um, and we were at university together, so we're old friends. And um, he came he came on to the project and co-directed and co-wrote and wrote some new scenes as well. So that's how that happened. And I think that was 2018. Wow. So... You know, there's a fair, fair few uh, strings to your bow there with the acting, music and now directing. <laughs> well, the strings are a bit complicated in a way because what happens is it's given me a taste of of creating something rather than being... I mean, you are creating stuff when you're writing music, but, but being slightly in the service of somebody else's dream, which is what um, scoring films and, and probably theatre is like... Um, and to to be in charge of your own dream, as it were, was I really loved it. And um, I, I'm writing scripts and don't, don't know what to do with them. And um, the likelihood of doing another film, I don't know how great it is. I've just I'm just in the middle of doing a short film, um, but I, you know it's hard to get a film done. And but I, I'm I really am very very drawn to doing more. Yeah. Well. It's kind of it makes you the perfect guest for this podcast because the idea with because it's the podcast about music music and the moving image and generally people immediately will think of composers but obviously there's a whole gamut of people involved in in the the world of putting music to picture from composers to editors play a large role in that uh, directors um so having you as sort of like direct with your director hat on and your composer hat on makes you um i suppose a a, a a font of, uh, of of information or misinformation yeah, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> or misinformation i think any information is good information isn't it there's a whole if anybody wants some misinformation there's there's a lot of that on youtube oh there's plenty of misinformation it's, we seem to specialize in it now don't we <laughs> yes absolutely there is no actual truth anymore is it it's all misinformation it, yeah it's all yeah <laughs> under the skin I'd like to go under the skin with Stephen Warbeck, if you will, sort of talk about a kind of um, a recent project um, that you've worked on, because kind of what I'm interested with this podcast is sort of exploring um, people's processes um, and understanding, you know, how they go about it and understanding your relationship with with what you do. Um, So is there a specific um, sort of musical project that you uh, that you would um, that we can go under the skin with? Well, we we could we could talk about um, DNA or ADN, ADN, yes. or we could talk about the film I directed, which I also scored. Um, we could talk about 
the Children Act, although that's probably four or five years ago and I might not remember it quite so well. <laughs> okay. um, and then we could talk about um, Save the Cinema, which was made earlier this year and isn't out yet. Okay. Well, but, I mean, have you, do you have a preference? No, unfortunately not. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, I'm quite interested in, in ADN, or which is the French for DNA, if yeah. I'm right, which was you directed are. by Maiwa. My when, yeah. My when, my when, sorry, and my when. Yeah. Um, in terms of the process, so, and I want to come back to this as well, because obviously the, there's a there's a French connection. You mentioned before that you studied drama and French at university, and it seems like you're working with quite a lot of French directors. But So my when comes to you with a film. Um, talk us through the process step by step of of the exchanges between you uh, and and your process and how you approach sort of um, the sort of first iterations of music that you make well this film was um was the third film i've made with her so i made a film called police which is like police but with two s's instead of a c um which was about child protection unit in um in the french police and she sort of I can't remember what the word was, I suppose embedded. She was in, with them, embedded in their uh, day-to-day activities for about three months. Um, and then it, it's, it's actors, it's a fiction, but it's based very strongly on 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 real stuff. Um, and then there was a film called Mon Roi, My King. And then there was ADN. Now, ADN, or let's call it DNA for now, um, is... Um, is quite autobiographical. Uh, both of the other films really, really meant a lot to her. And I, I know that most films mean a lot to to the director <clears throat> and the creator. But I think in the case of My Wen, it's e- even stronger because there's such a big autobiographical element in it. Now, that doesn't mean anything particularly, except that you can't... It's not like just another job. You're aware that you, a door's been opened into a very, very real, personal, imaginative, creative life, and that you're being invited to be part of something that's going on for years and is taking up a lot of that person's energy. So it's not just like saying, "Okay, two months, I'll do you a few tunes," and it, it's it, you. You have to have not a kind of false reverence, but a real reverence for what that person has put into the film, what they've exposed of themselves in the film. Mm. Um, does that does that mean there's an increased sort of sense of pressure when it's someone is so kind of embedded in a in a film in that it's about them? Um I think there is a there is a greater sense of there's greater pressure, but there's also what's important, I think, and I, I'm not saying that we should kind of bury our own views and that we, of course we have views and we have opinions about how our work should develop but um you have to really be aware that you are in this is in my view of course that you are in the service of somebody else's bigger original idea and that you've been brought in to contribute that to re- to to contribute to it and to respond to it but you need a bit of humility um and you need somehow to defend yourself as well at the same time. So that um, I found with a lot of French directors, they're very direct. Um, and they'll they'll say, oh, no, 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 je n'aime pas ça, I don't like that. Um, now, an English director will quite often say, I think this is absolutely fantastic what you've done. But I just wonder if we, if we could just go in a slightly different direction. But um, a French director would say, oh, I don't like that, Stephen. That's not working. Stephen, that's boff. That's mad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> C'est so, la merde. <laughs> exactly. So you have to say to yourself constantly, this is not a personal affront. It is simply because there is a big, big idea in this person's mind and I'm not tuned into it yet. So, I mean, I've, with French directors and specifically with my win, I've spent hours playing something, no, 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 c'est pas ça, and, and having to move on. And, and it's just important to try and keep your, your own sense of worth and not get damaged or too buffeted by the, those things. And it is worth it because when you find it, because it's such a collaborative process, 
often you might you're coming up with stuff that you wouldn't have thought of yourself on your own if you weren't with such a stringent working with such a stringent director that's a very important thing to remember i think that we oh god oh i wish it was easier i wish that so and so really liked the first suggestion i sent in that's fine and it's true as well and you're sitting for hours and hours reworking rethinking reimagining stuff but the advantage of all of that is that you could be moved in a direction that is not your first um your first idea and it might provoke you to write some stuff that's more outside your normal track if you like mm. yeah that that's really interesting because obviously you are creating something and you are sort of almost putting your heart on the line by going look at this wonderful thing that i've created for someone to then turn around and go no 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 j'aime pas <laughs> yeah. um that's that's quite difficult but it's very yeah it's a an interesting insight to sort of think okay but that's going to push you into an area which you might not have discovered yourself have you have you found it easy with time to kind of tell yourself that or, or when you were starting out did you sort of take it more personally that kind of feedback no i don't think i've found it easier i think i've cemented a theory onto it which makes it officially easier but i think that it's actually massively hurtful and um, when you've spent you've maybe i don't know whether the people were, who might listen to this were people who work at night or people who work at day but sometimes you've been um up really late and you've come up with something and you've recorded it or or you're going to play it to the person on the piano whatever method you're using um and they don't like it it's very very hurtful and there's no point in me pretending that's not the case or that i've found a way of avoiding it i've just found a way of understanding it um so that intellectually or on the surface of it i understand what's going on yeah and is it the case that you know with this relationship specifically like okay i don't like it but um is she then able to offer you know reasons for what she doesn't like or is it just because i mean p people don't this happens probably more than people realize but actually composers sort of get sacked halfway through a gig and i always think it's not because of a lack of ability it's because there's some kind of communication breakdown um but is it is it a case of you know because obviously if if there isn't any constructive feedback or constructive criticism it's hard to know what's not working so how do you kind of bridge that gap of them not liking it but then trying to understand what it is that they don't like well often you don't bridge it and you get sacked like you say i mean i think my agent said she reckoned about two-fifths of um projects ended not complete for for composers i don't know what the statistics actually are but i mean i've certainly been sacked quite a few times and um, once sacked <clears throat> before I started, because um, the producer said, can you write some music for the opening sequence? Um, and I said, yeah, definitely. Um, can you show me the film? And she said, I, I can't. Um, I'm not showing you the film. I just want you to write for this sequence. And it just seemed ridiculous to me. And for once, I, I stuck my, do you stick your feet in or your neck out or whatever it is? <laughs> Or put your anchor down, or do you, anyway, I did something. You put, you put your foot down, didn't you? Put your foot down, that's it. I put my foot down. I, ju I just said, I've got to see the whole film, or I don't know what I'm writing for. I don't know what the tone of the whole piece is. And I thought that it would go into a little heated few days of emails and phone calls. And it didn't. It lasted 24 hours and they got someone else. But um, <laughs> wow. okay. normally, normally, when one is sacked, it's later on in the process than that but it's certainly it's when when you talk about bridging the gap i mean sometimes it's just not bridgeable because we just don't communicate with each other what we need um i think there's another myth i'm sorry if i'm talking too much but i suppose i am supposed to be talking <laughs> um, <laughs> please do another myth that that there's oh that's not quite right but actually don't listen to that comment because the comment is inaccurate because there is no right music for a project. There's no right composer for it. If you and I were writing the music for the same film, we come up with different things. One wouldn't be right and one wrong. The director might like one better than the other, but 
So you have to also remind yourself that my Wen does not like this piece of music. That doesn't mean it's a bad piece of music. It just means that she doesn't want that piece of music on her film. Yeah. But presumably, obviously, you've completed my Wen, so you were she wasn't liking specific cues you were able to go away and, and come up with you were able to bridge that gap you were able to come away with something yeah. that you you both liked and sometimes it was very i mean she works in a very sort of ha- hands-on way so sometimes it would involve um imagine you're playing a ch- the tune or the theme on the piano because um a lot of it's done with midi mock-ups and stuff but sometimes if she visited me i play the thing on the piano and she said no 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 arrête. just stop there stop there play that bit again, no, more slowly, now stop, now play the next phrase. And the first time that happened on Police, I thought, this is balmy. I really, I just, I can't be micromanaged. But actually what she did was she pulled apart a tune and made it, rather than certain and finite, she made it very provisional and tentative. And that really suited the... the. Um, the feeling of the of of what was needed. It reminds me a bit of um, La Vita e Bella, which is uh, Benigni and um, I can't remember the composer's name temporarily. Uh, Italian composers, fantastic. Um, there's a the main theme of that almost seems to stop between phrases, and it's a heartbreaking film. And I feel that the heartbreak is even more because the tune somehow doesn't feel like it can carry on. Um, And sometimes you'd say that if you were watching a gig or something, you might say, this is imperfect, or the solo instrument slightly out of tune, or the piano is slightly out of tune, or it seems to be not the best piano. But in a film, well, maybe in music as well, but in a film, that music might be the very personality that's needed. That imperfection, that hesitancy or whatever the idiosyncrasies are, might be the very thing that makes it take off or or fly. Yeah, absolutely. I th- always think that, you know, the imperfections in rhythm is what we call the groove. You know, it, it, it isn't exactly to, to click. And the sort of imperfections... And funny, that what you sounds like what you're talking about there, sitting it down at the piano with my Wen, whereas before you might have recorded something to click or to a specific tempo, she was sort of saying, no, perform it. Um, yeah. and leave gaps and, and you don't have to sort of have a resolving cadence. You can have it sort of, and, and in doing so, you kind of almost breathe a, a life into the same piece of music, which the way it had been initially composed wasn't quite right, but by actually just performing it and feeling it to her, that yeah. then worked. Yeah. That, that is, I mean, that's very accurate what you say about breathing breathing life into something. Um and we can, especially because of MIDI and computers and so on, we can operate in a very um, sterile, arid sort of uh, environment. And sometimes you just have to, well, I, I believe you do, and I know that some people would work more intellectually and less instinctively. I believe that I, when I work for it to be a successful piece of work, I need to put some feeling into it, and it needs to mean something to me. And when I write a piece of work that means nothing to me, um, I'm never going to be happy with it, you know. So somehow in that collaboration with the director, you're going to have to find something that pleases her or him. And it also has to please you. Yeah. Have, Have you ever been in a position where something hasn't pleased you, but in order to sort of move on, you've just sort of conceded or would you in that put, would you put your foot down again in that instance? Um, I think I've probably conceded quite often. I mean, I can remember a particular example of a very, very sympathetic character who was supposed to be vile. um, And the director was saying, you've got to make him more threatening. You've got to make him more threatening. He wasn't remotely threatening. um, So I was adding sort of semi-quavers on a bass clarinet and all sorts of kind of tricks to try and make this bloke threatening. And in my view, it was making it ridiculous he didn't look any more threatening he'd have been more threatening if you'd played a you know a bit of a cliche a little children's um nursery rhyme on a toy piano would have been more threatening but i mean um 
he wanted all this sort of terror to happen and um, it was counterproductive but it was such he he felt so strongly about it and we were kind of in agreement for most of the score but for those bits i i conceded and um don't think they don't think they ever really worked mm, interesting um i'm just going going back to something you said before about the instance where you put your foot down and you weren't prepared to compose until you sort of the, the title sequence until you'd sort of seen the film. So, do you never you would never get a script and sort of go through it and then sort of start coming up with ideas? You'd always want to sort of see the visuals oh, no, before I would. you start coming up with any sort of ideas for it. No, no, hundred percent, I would do that. What what happened in that instance is I felt I was being excluded from there. It, the film existed. It was a it was a first cut. But it was done, you know, it was put together. Um, if I'm involved from script stage, that's the stage everyone's at. I just don't like the idea of um, a kind of selection. I, f I feel like it's probable, uh, which I didn't realise at the time, that she was already thinking, I'll get a couple of composers to write the music for the beginning of this film and see which we like best. Now, even if grudgingly I accept that to be true, I still don't think you can really write the music of a picture without seeing the whole thing. But I have often started with them um, from the script. You know, when you're engaged in something right from early on, I have done that. Um, but although I would say that I probably generally find that you change direction a bit once you've seen the image. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it seems ludicrous that if the film exists that to not to show the composer because that's only going to help inform you yeah. um along those lines. But then it was interesting listening to an interview with um, Hans Zimmer and that actually Christopher Nolan had him compose a load of cues without showing him um, the visuals. I think it was on Interstellar. Um and weirdly Hans Zimmer was sort of doing things with certain scenes in mind because I don't think he was even saying this is for a specific scene um, and then a few weeks later he'd get a cut of the film and that cue was in exactly the same position where he sort of he'd sort of imagined it having having read the script but yeah I, it's one of those conversations isn't it? I always think if you can involve the composer from the beginning so that they a they feel part of the process but also kind of you know, I suppose more invested in it, but also, you know, as the project develops, that sort of they grow with it, and it seems to me that that could only result in ultimately a better, better final product. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think that um, with about two thirds of the French things I've done, they haven't, they haven't used temp music. I've provided the temp music because I've been involved early enough. I've been composing and making mock-ups uh, maybe using some real instruments using some samples and so on like everyone does um so the music's evolving during the edit edit and you're finding oh that theme works well there maybe try it somewhere else i love that and we we in fact we did the same on a, a welsh film called save the cinema which i did with sarah sugarman earlier this year um same thing they didn't have temp music on i was feeding this they did have a little bit at the very beginning but i was feeding stuff in right from early on mm. that's interesting yeah because i've i'm just working on a short film at the moment where i said at the beginning i would like to avoid temp tracks if possible um, and for obvious anyone who's listening who doesn't know what a temp track is is basically when the editor puts in a temporary piece of music so that they can sort of edit and get the flow of it um, which then gets taken out and then the composer um, puts their their take on it the problem with the temp track is that sometimes the people involved become so invested in the temp track that anything other than a copy of the temp track isn't acceptable but then the, the flip side of what you're talking about is that if the film's not picture locked every time there's an edit of the film you then have to go back and and edit the cues so you end up sort of having the same cue edited so <laughs> i think one of the scenes i'm on at the moment I edited it. I did 20 different edits of the same cue for the cue then to be thrown out and then started again. So it's, it's, but presumably you prefer to work that way. You prefer to have it temp free so that the first thing that people see is your vision rather than an editor's or a, you know, another composer's. I, I do prefer it. Um, I'm not terrified by temp music that somebody else is. Sometimes it, it's a way into the conversation 
um, with the director because you say that the director says, this is working well. Um, what do you think? And you say, well, it seems to be a bit sluggish or it's great, or, but it's a bit sentimental or whatever it is. So it can start your conversation in quite a handy way. Um, but but no, I mean, I would prefer, I'd prefer the, um, the, the providing the music right the way through. And, and with regard to editing it, and what I'd often let them do is chop it, let the editor chop the music horribly, and then leave it for a few versions and say, OK, do you think we're nearly there? Because I'll now do a version, I'll speed it up by 2 BPM, and I'll cut that phrase out. And, and it's true, that's a bit of a palaver, because also it doesn't always fit. However you edit it, it, you can sort of feel the bits that aren't there or, or have been extended too long. Or The other thing, just briefly on, on the temporary music or temp music thing, which is a pick, gets us in a pickle, is when, say, you're doing a short film like you said you are now, um, and they put an orchestral piece on, and you say, hang on, we've, we're supposed to be doing this for 800 quid. Um, how do you expect me to do that? Yeah. Um, and they've put a bit of Hans Zimmer on from Interstellar or whatever it is, and yep. you've had it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the classic, isn't it? Um, but I think, you know, luckily from my point of view, um, some of the, the, v, the VSTs, the kind of virtual instruments that you can buy now, you know, that Spitfire and people like that make, it's never going to be as good as, as a real orchestra, but it can go some way to um to, to bridging that gap because we're the best way yeah. in the world getting an orchestra to record one cue for 800 pounds is going to be uh, it's going to be pretty difficult yeah that's true yeah um so something something that i kind of is always i try to have at the back of my mind is this idea of kind of irreverence or you know trying to do something a little bit different because i think creatively that's where the greatest reward comes but also you know for someone who's asking you to sort of add your magic to their vision um doing something different and being a, a bit irreverent um adds something to it in, in whatever way shape or form that it that comes um i seem to remember from a conversation we had years ago um you're kind of always looking for kind of like a slightly unique texture or unique something. How do you, because at the same time, you don't want to just be irreverent for the sake of being irreverent. If somebody wants something slightly more classical, then then that's fine. But how do you go about bringing in a, a, an element, element or, or irreverence or, or, you know, making it sound typically Stephen Warbeck? Um, there, well, there was a bloke, I might have told you this years ago as well. There's a man called Philip Kaufman, um, who directed Quills, which you mentioned earlier. Um, and it was probably, it wasn't quite, but it was sort of one of the first, inverted commas, big films um, where I didn't previously have any, I, had, I hadn't worked with him in television, I hadn't done anything with him. It was a new, it was out of the blue. He asked for me to write the score for Quills. And it was probably about 1999, 2000, somewhere around then. I'm not sure exactly. Um and I was having terrible trouble because I sort of knew it was a big film and I was trying to write big tunes that f sort of like films had. And I was I probably a little bit frightened of it. Um, big epic moments. And he said to me after a few weeks, he said, the reason I gave you the job is because I want something as mad as you are. Um, <laughs> now... <laughs> I don't know if I'm mad. I think we're all mad. So, But basically, you can interpret that as saying um, your idiosyncrasies and your oddness is you. Mm. We need you to write the music of this. We don't want you to imitate somebody else, Stanley Myers, Hans Zimmer, who, who, you know, Rachel Portman, whoever it happens to be. We want you to write the music out of your oddness. So I think trusting... That's the first step is to say, this is my voice. And to say, you know, um, the Kippers, who you mentioned earlier, which is my band, is a nutty little band. Um, and I sometimes think, oh, that's just that. That's just to one side. That's just silly. But in actual fact, that might be more authentically what I sound like 
than a lot of other things. And I think you need to lean into what you feel you authentically sound like. So that if you want to double, I've been using a lot in recent term, not in my Wens films, by the way, in order not to um, confuse anybody, um, but I've been using tenor banjo a lot. Um, and I just love that orchestra with a, a little tenor banjo thing in. That's the sort of thing I like to do. So to take something that's very irreverent and not very orchestral and mix it in with some very serious, inverted commas again, strings or um, or whatever it happens. And you've got a little motor of an arpeggiated um, tenor banjo, for example, and sometimes the strings are rather damped. Dunk, 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 dunk. Um, that was slightly inspired also by um, a Dutch... Um, Filmmaker, what's his, his things? Oh, Alex van Varmadam. Anyway, if if anyone gets a, a chance, I think it's his brother that does his music for his films. They're strange films, but what's great about them is the music really goes out on a limb. It doesn't doesn't say oh, I'm going to play it safe. I'll just be strings and a single line piano tune, which yeah. of course I also do. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, have you there's um have you well, okay, so on the subject of dutch there's a dutch composer uh, i always get his name wrong here we go cristobal tapia de Vier. he did the music for there was a series called utopia on channel four years ago and then more recently there's an hbo series called white lotus and it's it's absolutely bonkers but in such a wonderful way because it's it's the, one of those classic things where you hear a score and you go wow who's done that i need to find that yeah. out because it's just so off the rails and so kind of different um to anything and yeah i think obviously there's it's interesting what you say about basically adding your not overthinking it but actually adding your your personality to it your sort of yeah. and because kippers so if you listen to the because there was a, in in the DNA score, there's a kind of a, a sort of weird string instrument. It's not guitar, but something along it's those oud. lines. Isn't it? It's an oud. Oud. Okay, yeah. So that was a kind of like a unique yeah. texture yeah. Um, within that. And then when you uh, the man is it the man with the hat? Yeah. Um, the score for that you can definitely. I mean, if anybody wants to check it out on Spotify, is he on Spotify? Kippers. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, um, but I can definitely hear in the score with the man with the hat. I can definitely hear the sort of like the, the classic Stephen Warbeck influence of you know, from Kippers because obviously it's accordion and you play the accordion in the well you play loads yeah. of instruments in the in the Kippers. But um, but it, no, you're right. There's accordion, accordion, mandolin, clarinet. Um, that's the sort of range of stuff, and also working with a group of musicians who I've worked with a lot over the years, which is another thing which we haven't touched on, which is um, if you want your individual, well, it's not yours, but an individual voice or individual sound, choose who you're going to have playing it very carefully. So you know that somebody plays the cello in a certain way or um, you know that Dario, um, who plays on DNA and the man, it's the man in, oh, now you've confused me, the man in the hat. <laughs> The man in that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, he plays on both of them. And I kind of know, I don't obviously know exactly what he's going to do, but I can, when I'm writing it, I'm thinking of how it's going to be, partly because of the, the nature and sensitivity and approach of the musician. So I think that's a very important thing when you're finding the particular voice for a, for a film to take into account who's going to be playing it. It mm. sounds obvious, but I think it's... You know, and if you think of something like Paris, Texas or Life is Beautiful, which is, by the way, composed by Nicola Piavani, I remembered it now. Um, those, you'd say definitely, if they haven't played the instrument themselves, those are very, very carefully chosen musicians. They're not just going, you know, to a fixer and saying, get me 20 banjo players and an accordion. You need to know what the, what their approach is and what their voice is like and and again I, that probably feeds back into what you were saying about and it's not like you so you you pick your one banjo player it's not like the other banjo players aren't great at what they do it's just no. that this particular one does it in a particular way which really resonates with you therefore yeah. you tend to go back to them because you know that they're going to deliver a little piece of themselves with their performance exactly yes 
Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. So don't overthink irreverence. No. I think I heard a thing with Christian Henson where he talked about this is about drawing on drawing on your influences and because I know you sort of you mentioned you mentioned rock and roll earlier and whilst Kipper's sort of genre wise wouldn't probably be rock and roll I think there's a, a definite rock and roll uh, element to them. Well, we at school we, we I was I formed a band with my friend Andrew Rankin who then became the Pogues drummer. So oh. he he sort of did it for real and I did it for pretend um yeah. but i loved rock and roll as a teenager and you know I, I also bob dylan would be a huge influence and those influences enrich you like you, you know like you're saying really that they, they and you don't need to shy away from them and klezmer music has influenced me and um greek music i love and sometimes the harmony of popular songs don't be embarrassed by the harmony of popular of popular folk music or whatever it happens to be it's it's all our music we don't have to pretend to be over sophisticated sometimes the simple solutions are going to be the best getting a taste if we may get a taste for you know your your musical tastes and um, because obviously everything that you've kind of consumed over the years from when you started out playing piano as a four-year-old to kind of today have probably influenced you in some way have there been sort of specific, you mentioned Bob Dylan, but other sort of specific bands or albums? I've talked about albums, it's probably a slightly outdated concept now, but specific bands or albums that have kind of, you know, that have been seminal in your kind of, I suppose, musical progression? I suppose I'd have to say that Bob Dylan is probably the largest, but I don't know if he's, if he's really influenced the nature of the composition. He's just the biggest figure in my um musical hinterland i suppose and what, what was it about bob dylan that you found so inspiring then i just feel like he he chronicles obviously he didn't think he was doing this but he chronicles my life it feels like anything in, that happens in my life has been told by bob dylan and if i wanted to have somebody telling the story um there'd be a song there'd be a a phrase, a line, um, somewhere in Bob Dylan, which would do it, you know. And the, um, that there are also, I mean, I knew the Beatles backwards, but at school it was very uncool to like the Beatles. So you had to pretend to like the Rolling Stones. Well, in my group, and Jimi Hendrix, who I really did did both like both those things, or or John Mayall's Blues Breakers, or whoever it happened to be. Um, but when I went home, I listened to the Beatles and. And I wouldn't go into school saying I've bought the Abbey Road, although I did have Abbey Road, you know. I, it's That's so funny because I think the the equivalent of my childhood was the whole Britpop thing, Blur versus Oasis. You couldn't like both, you had to like one or the other. Um, I actually went completely out on a limb and, and didn't like either of them. I, I liked Rage Against the Machine and Metallica at the time. So, um, But it's, it's funny how this sort of, the kind of war of the bands sort of from generation yeah. to generation continues. But maybe you can now look back and say, "Don't look back in anger" is a good song. Absolutely, I you know I think even if at the time you weren't supposed to like that song. No, I I did like um, um, what's the story, Morning Glory. So their second album really resonated with me um, because of the acoustic nature of the guitars and and there was a lot of kind of rods been played on the drums and the sort of soft drum sound. I really, really liked that. Um, and yeah, looking back, you know, I can absolutely appreciate both Blur and Oasis, but, um, but yeah, at the time, <laughs> I, I just have arguments with friends about, you know, whether hip hop was better than meth. I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Arguing about what, as you say, there's no, yeah. there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. It's just, you know, what one person listens to and loves another person might listen to and, and not like, um, is there anything that you would never listen to? Um, I don't think there is. I mean, I, I, sometimes my children, who are not really children now, um, would listen to stuff and I wouldn't like it. But I, I'd try and listen to it and try and be open to it, but not always succeed. Um, I tend to be, I suppose I tend to be slightly sentimental um, and which connects to the thing where I feel like if you're writing something, 
that doesn't mean anything to you, it's probably not worth much. That's mm. how I feel. Um, and I feel this, that a song to be to mean something to me is going to have a kind of emotional landscape to it or it's going to make me feel sad or happy or whatever it happens to be. Mm. Um, and it's... On on the subject of sentimental, is there a is there a piece of music or pieces of music which kind of bring you to tears or almost bring you to tears? Well, I suppose, and it's probably a very cliche thing. I suppose Mahler probably, or you know, if um, or Leonard Cohen, um, Bob Dylan can can drive me to tears. Um, the Beatles probably can't make me cry. Even I feel like they don't plunge themselves quite as deep into the world that humans have created and messed up as Bob Dylan does or Leonard Cohen. That You know, the the, uh, famous blue raincoat of Leonard Cohen. Is it blue? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, (laughs) um, your famous blue raincoat is torn at the shoulder. It's just some of the some of those lines, but th- this isn't really talking about music. This is more talking about songs. But there's definitely, um, you know, there's um, Keith Jarrett's record, "The Morning of a Star." Um, there'd be there'd be records dotted through the sixties, seventies, and then to a lesser extent later, that really are like rocks of um, stuff that I've tied myself to. And later, what's happened, and I don't want to be an old dinosaur, is that I haven't immersed myself to the same extent in single projects. So you kind of plug your phone into the speakers in the kitchen and you say, oh, I'm going to listen to one of Brian Eno's um, Another Green World or, you know, one track. But we... You used to really immerse yourself in stuff, which may maybe explains why it feels more important, because you put the whole album on and you'd be swept away by that whole thing. Now you listen to one track and then maybe even somebody says, oh, can I put this on? And stops it before the end of the track. So <laughs> yeah. that happens a lot, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to pick up on something you said then as well. So the, the certain line about the, the My Blue Raincoat, and you're talking about the lyric. Do you think that lyric would have the same emotional potency if it didn't have the musical accompaniment? No, definitely not. No, definitely not. Although he's not a good example of that because Leonard Cohen really works on paper as a poet. But um, generally, no, I don't think it would. And I think um, certain songs, a cliched example would be blackbird would look quite good on paper but something else happens with the the little ascending guitar thing you know that that all of those things come together to make the whole a a, a synergy an emotional synergy between the lyrics and well i suppose the same could be said uh, you know you take the the synergy of music and you add it to picture and and the the two combined are actually more emotive and more powerful than either one in its own right Yes, yes, I agree. There was um, um, Roland Joffe, who um, was the director of the mission, made a rather strange film, um, A There Be Dragons, it's called, um, about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, which I scored. And then, and he, he phoned me up and said, oh, I'm so thrilled with it. And then about seven months later, they recut it. It was released and stuff and released a new version, which was different, with a different composer. So it ended up being slightly... um, Well, I wasn't miserable because I didn't know about it for a bit anyway. Um, But he said something really strong to the orchestra when he came into the um, recording studio. He said, we had a a big orchestra for that. And he said, "Um, can I talk to them before we start? And I said, yes, of course. It's very nice if... um, a director speaks to the musicians and they feel part of the whole project. So it's not just coming in for a job and going away again. And he said, um, we've constructed the film. This is what he said to the musicians. We've made the skeleton and we've created this thing. And now it's up to you to breathe the life into it. Um, I know that's not, it's sort of quite slight in a way, but it's not many words. But for me, that's sort of what it is. Um, 
if you if you watch the film without sound, it will have an effect on you. But we can breathe in another very, very hard to define element. And there are people who've written papers and are doctors on it and all sorts of stuff. But we don't quite, you and me or most people, don't quite know why music does what it does to us. And um, I'm I'm not religious, but um, when was it? About three years ago, maybe five, I was in the kitchen and there was <coughs> on the radio, there was a piece of Bach. And I was just, it was like a wave hit me. And I thought, if there is a God, there it is. In that, a kind of absolutely useless thing in terms of you can't eat it, you can't ride it along the road, you can't... But this creation is one of the most beautiful things you can imagine, and it's having a big effect on me. And you kind, you sort of don't know why, why it's happening, but you know that it's profound and important and maybe one of the only things of value that we do when we, you know, and, well, and now we make lots of valuable <laughs> things. But compared with some of the things humans get up to, writing music is a fairly wonderful and privileged thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, that, that ability to connect, you know, this is Bach who who lived, I don't know, 18, is he 18th century? 19th? Yeah. 18th century. But he's long gone, but yet something that he created can still have that kind of ex- emotional impact on you. Um, is you know speaks volumes to, to what he did. Um, is there anything that you've heard recently, sort of more modern, um, sort of whether it be film scores or bands or anything like that, musically, where there's something that's really sort of stood out and got your attention that you think... I should or people should go and have a listen to. I bought Sarah, my partner, um, a backlab, a backlamas. Is it called? Well, I can't even remember now. It's a six-string, small Greek thing, like a tiny bazooki, but it's a really nice one. Um, and we've been listening to this traditional Greek music, and there's something. It's like you feel like you've gone in. Keep putting it on. All that we've got a CD. Put it in the CD player press play and you're sort of transported into this other world into this dark little room and the it's bright outside and these very very scratchy wonderful instruments and you know modes which aren't the same as ours um the same as uk modes if there are if there is such a thing but i mean i love that and i'm just transported then so for about three months that is on nearly all the time yeah um, well, I suppose at a time when you can't really travel, you could pop that on, and while you're having your dinner, you might be mistaken for thinking you're in a small taverna in Crete. Exactly. Well, it is Cretan music, you see, and that I love Cretan music, and and I picture the small taverna in Crete where I was uh, once, or we were once. The children weren't really; in, they were running around, but so it's just Sarah and I and the musicians, and four children running around. Bliss. That's bliss. That's that's sort of like heaven, really. Okay, so cre- Cretan, Cretan, Cretan bazooka music. There you go. What, yeah, can well, you, was it? Can you remember the name of the artist? Was it a, a sort of a selection of different artists, or was it a specific artist? Well, there was one. I'm not sure if he's on the Yanis Siloris and Nikos Siloris, um, and the one of the big um, Cretan instruments is the lyra, which is like a violin played like that. But um, I vaguely think of getting one but i know it'd be a waste of time because you stop the string by pushing your nail against it so you'll be kind of learning an entirely new technique and you'd spend and you'd find it's your your birthday and you're still no better than you were at the last birthday so you spent years you learning one instrument where you're going out of your way not to let your nail hit the other string and this one you're doing <laughs> exactly it purposely. exactly what bob dylan calls unlearning i think yeah what about sort of tv film series i know obviously you kind of work in do a lot of theater and you probably um see quite a lot of theater but do you spend a lot of time watching sort of tv series and and films um i didn't watch any tv series really since i left home which is quite a while ago until um in march um all my family moved back 
so we there were nine of us um and um we bought a projector and we've been watching loads of stuff and i and i should i don't i feel kind of disloyal to other composers to say what i thought i mean some of it is unspeakable and some of it's utterly wonderful you know it really is it's very very interesting it's very so it's very educational and but um my family get very fed up with me they say dad dad just watch it do you, why do you always have to talk about the music just shut up so you, it is kind of um i don't know if i'm watching it right i think i'm probably not watching it right i'm not watching it like you would normally watch it objectively i'm being very sort of seeing what's happening where and why they're doing that and yeah i i've, I've got a friend like that you go, go you watch a film with him and you go he'll go lydian oh yeah mix a lydian oh you hear mix lydian there and he'll sort of yeah. talk you through the modes of every single cue um which is is great but he'll also try and do that during a gig as well you go to see a sort of an orchestra and he'll be like lydian it's like yeah okay it's okay i'm just gonna let the music wash over me um yeah but can you can you you can't remember any of the names of those series that you've watched and loved? I'm not I'm not saying no I I I mean no I can't remember I mean I can remember but I, I, there was one of Killing Eve was quite intriguing and, oh yeah and the Vigil and oh yes we've watched a few um quite a few and then and then sometimes I actually like that thing about Catherine I thought some of that music was really bold. Mm. Catherine, was it called The Good, it was called, I think. Very, very, that's really irreverent because it's like the whole thing is irreverent. It's like telling history and saying, I'm going to tell history in a different way. I thought that was a nice, bold bit of television. Yeah, great. I kind of like to finish off the podcast uh, with the uh, with what I'm calling the trivia section. Okay. Um, do you have any sort of random music-related or sort of visual-related trivia um, that you think the world should know? Oh, I see. Oh, God, that's a bit of a responsibility. <laughs> Put you on the spot. If, yeah. if you don't, then I have some questions that I could ask you. Why don't you ask some questions? I think everyone should cycle a lot more. Yes. <laughs> well, that's just, that's just a fact. That's not trivia, is it? <laughs> Yeah. We all need to do more exercise. Yeah. Do you know what the biggest selling movie soundtracks of all time were? There's two, kind of like almost in joint top position. This is going to be a surprise, isn't it? I was surprised. Um, um, but think it's it's at a time when movie soundtracks were more consistently done by bands or artists so what what do you call it the thing me jig i know um what do you the uh the russian thing um which granada then remade um dr chivago nope no and um 2001 nope no i'll give you give you a clue for the first one um i can i should have thought of a clue beforehand shouldn't i um <laughs> Gib. That's not helping me. Is it not? Okay, no. it was pretty pretty out there. Oh, well, I'll, I'll put you out of your misery. It, the, the first one is um, Saturday Night Fever. Bloody hell. Yeah, one of the top-selling movie soundtracks. It was obviously, it wasn't entirely the Bee Gees, but, you know, very heavily the Bee Gees. And the other one was The Bodyguard with Whitney Houston. Well, that is a surprise. Yeah. Um, They're big surprises. But again, it was... This is a sort of an era when it, 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 it well, certainly felt like, you know, in, in the sort of 80s and, well, I suppose one of those is the 70s, but certainly up until the 90s, you know, the, the soundtrack to a film was kind of quite often there was a specific artist who would sort of do a lot of that music. Um, whereas I, I might be wrong, but it feels like now albums are kind of made up more, much more of lots of different artists to sort of have mass appeal to lots of people. But so there you go. Very um, interesting. Yeah, well... Um, Albums also were an actual physical thing. Yes. But obviously, I think cashing in on... Well, cashing in being the opposite word, because obviously this was back at a time when, you know, selling physical you know, physical entities of albums was as a huge, um, huge part of the music industry, whereas now, 
um, much less so. You know, the, the golden era of being able to print CDs in their millions and flog them for a tenner each is, uh, is long gone. And now, yeah. it, with each stream, the artist gets 0.0047 pence per, per stream. Yeah, and I thought it was bad when I was getting 19 cents per CD of Shakespearean, Shakespearean Love. But actually, that seems a lot better than the streaming um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. At least you're getting an actual full pence or full cent, yeah. 19 yeah. of them. Yeah, it is. But also, apparently, the stuff that's the most um, money-making streams are not are, are things like waves on a beach and sleep sounds and all of that stuff is making yeah. more, more money than the music. Because it's just hours and hours of... Um of stream stuff there's been a huge piano yeah. uh, renaissance as well in sort of well renaissance but in sort of um instrumental piano music again because you can have entire playlists of instrumental piano music which is just sort of great background music for studying or for you know relaxing to and and again you, that can sort of rack up the stream so it's interesting how the revenue stream starts to somehow dictate um how much things um get get played but my my son herbie said when he goes on holiday he keeps thinking he should put one of my things on repeat would that work <laughs> it would but it'd probably only be about 50p if you went for two weeks so <laughs> right so it's not worth it i think in the in the early days of streaming and spotify i think there were cases of people who were sort of doing that was like literally putting their albums on repeat and leaving it playing overnight um but uh, yeah i suppose it could still potentially work good quick fire trivia for you um what scares you oh what really? I suppose uh, death isn't particularly <laughs> doesn't seem doesn't seem great. Or death of somebody close to me. Um, okay. Those those are fairly frightening. Yeah. Um, um, little known fact about you. Um, I like cycling. <laughs> <laughs> and you think everybody should cycle more? Apparently, as well. Yeah, I do. Oh, I know one. If I last till eighty, I. I'm allowed, this is my own rule for myself, I'm allowed to take up smoking again and um, start acting again. <laughs> I, I sincerely hope you live to 90 because I would love to have that 10-year period from 80 to 90 where the smoking Stephen Warbeck is just popping up in every film. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Um, and finally... Is there a song that you would like to hear an irreverent cover of or piece of music? I think that I can think of irreverent covers because Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen is insanely good and some of the versions are irreverent covers and just it's like a, an empty van or an empty truck. There's nothing inside it. It's just the notes and the tune. But when you hear it for in in his version something very different happening so i don't yeah. want to hear any more irreverent things that was enough <laughs> we want more reverence just just, just more, <laughs> more reverence in the world more reverence exactly yeah. yeah um fantastic well Stephen, thank you so much for sort of taking the time to chat to me it's been um fascinating and and entertaining as ever um uh, with with this, it's always a question of if people want to find out uh, find out about Stephen Warbeck and what he's up to. Where where can they find you? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, probably online. Am I? I expect so. <laughs> I don't know. Wikipedia? No. Spotify. <laughs> Um, well, uh, Kippers, Kippers on Spotify. They can find out about Kippers, and all obviously all your soundtracks are on Spotify as well. And I think um, there's a oh god, yes, <laughs> sorry, there's a solo EP that I made during lockdown. Um, it was done here. It was produced by um, a friend called Isaac Waddington. So it's um, it's mainly me, but it's him as well with with backing vocals and stuff. It's um, it's funny but serious. It's a, it's quite a. It's sad things about um, people waiting at the harbour for boats to come in and uh, drinking halves of bitter in pubs in Finsbury Circus. It's, I mean, it's sort of serious, but it's a bit silly. Okay. But that's that exists. It's called uh, making the coffee. Making the coffee, and is that yeah. under your name or is that an yeah? It's name? under no, that's my name. Yeah. Okay, 
fantastic and i should point out as well obviously for people listening to this is in the background behind you you've got what looks to be an absolute veritable treasure chest of weird and wonderful musical instruments from euphoniums to um analog keyboards to everything yeah that, yeah there's a, there are a few things here that's true yeah yeah in your in your, in your man cave yeah, and there's a bow. And there's a bow. Who everybody needs a good bow, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Ready ready to play the electric guitar. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Stephen, well, thank you so much for um taking the time to chat and um yeah, good luck with all your future endeavors. Well, good luck to you Jim and really nice to talk to you and send me the name of that composer and let's meet up for a coffee or a beer at some point. Absolutely. Well, we're allowed out now, aren't we? We're allowed we are. to uh, interact with other human beings not just on zoom even though we've chosen to do this on zoom brilliant okay well lots of love and thanks a lot yeah pleasure Stephen. thank you mate take care thank you very much for listening if you've enjoyed this episode and given that you've listened this far i feel you might have then i would be honored and incredibly grateful if you could take a moment to subscribe rate and review on your podcast platform of choice by subscribing, you'll automatically be notified each time a new episode drops. And by rating the show, you tell the artificial intelligence that will soon be running the world that this podcast is worth listening to. I certainly get a lot of insights and value from these conversations, and I genuinely hope you do too. If you'd like to get in touch with the show, then you can email me, podcast at larpmusic.com. Larpmusic.com is my digital abode, and the home of the podcast is larpmusic.com forward slash sync music matters podcast. And sync music matters podcast is hyphenated. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.